I feel like I'm not afraid anymore. I think I'm, I, at this point now in my life, there was a time of shame, always feeling apologetic. When I tell artists that I'm working with or dance partners or in the audition room being like, oh, sorry, sorry, just constantly kind of like having my little bumps and stuff. I'm moving out of that phase and more of it, it is my power. It is my, what makes you different is what makes you special. You know, and I think that is universal. But for me, I think I'm finally finding that wearing it as a badge of honor. Hello, welcome to Theater Life Uncensored, where we peel back the curtain and reveal to you what's really working in today's industry for theater artists just like you. I'm your host, Jim Cooney, a New York City-based director choreographer, and I'm also the founder of Amplified Artists, a membership community for theater professionals helping you create a career and life you love. Today is a very special episode for a few reasons. First, it's our very last guest episode of the season, of our second season here. Now, I'll still be back next week for our season finale, but in terms of the guest interviews, this is our very last one. Another reason why this is special is usually we're talking on the show about our careers, but the name of the show is Theater Life Uncensored. So today we're going to be talking more about the life side of things and more about being human and being kind and being generous. And what makes this even more special is who I'm chatting with today. It's Broadway performer Jeff Gordy. Now, you may have seen a Playbill article that came out a few weeks ago. By the time this airs, it was probably about three or four weeks ago in the past, where he's talking about something that happened to him with his health when he was one year old that's permanently affected his life and how he's now helping another young boy around the same age who's going through the same exact thing and helping him with his life. It's a very inspirational and motivational story, and I don't want to share it out of turn. This is Jeff's story to share, so I'll let him share it here on the show. But I wanted to bring him on here to help raise awareness for this story and give him another platform that he could speak about this. We all could use more people like Jeff Gordy in the world. Now, I've been very blessed to know Jeff for about 10 years now. I first met him when he was a student at Point Park University. I was a visiting artist there for a year, teaching and choreographing, and he was a student of mine there. And I've gotten to see him go from that to where he is now performing on Broadway. He's currently in Chicago. He's also understudying the role of Billy Flynn and Fred Casely, and he's gone on for these, and we're going to talk about that on the show as well. Prior to that, he won the 2020 Helen Hayes Award for his performance in A Chorus Line at Signature Theater. He also did The Life at City Center here in New York that was directed by Billy Porter. Uh, he's also worked at some of the top uh, regional theaters in the country, such as the Muni and Sacramento Playhouse. And something I love about Jeff is he's always been more mature and wise than his age. And he shares on this episode today how that came to be and also gives you some really incredible advice about it. So I'm really pleased and honored to have Jeff on the show today. Now, this whole conversation that we're going to have about life, it's making me think about something else. If you've been listening to the show for a while, you've heard me talk about this resource, Dream Career Blueprint, and how it gives you the 20 essential building blocks you need to have your dream career. But it could easily be called the Dream Life Blueprint because so many of the things we're going to talk about on this episode today, like confidence, kindness, uh, facing rejection and dealing with that, these are all part of the 20 essential building blocks that we talk about in this blueprint. And as a listener of the show, I'm giving you a free copy of it. So you can download it by clicking the link to it in the show notes. And if you don't want to miss any episodes of the show, hit the subscribe and get notified button so you're the very first to know when the next episode is released. And if you want to connect with me outside of this episode, you can find me on Instagram. I'm at Jim Cooney NYC. Pop on over there and say hello. All right. Without any further ado, here's my conversation with Jeff Gordy. Hello, Jeff Gordy. It's so good to see you. Thank you for being here. I'm really excited to have this conversation with you today. Thanks, Jim. Always good to yeah. see you. Yeah. So we've known each other for a long time. We'll get into that. And, um, you know, I, I read the Playbill article that was featuring you and how you used uh, something that happened to you to help someone else. And so we're going to talk about all those good things. But the first thing I always like to ask people is how they describe themselves as an artist, because a lot of people struggle when they do multiple things and, and you do multiple things as well, like how you kind of sum that up. So I'd love for you to be able to share that from your perspective. Um, interesting. I, I feel like I generally say artists, but um, it's either artist or actor, I would say. Mm -hmm. And and even though you also are teaching too, do you ever talk about that as well? Or you just lead with artist and then the teaching? Artists, no. So my performance side, obviously, artists encompasses teaching and the acting side. So yeah. 
Yeah, and I do think artist is a good word. People have this uh, talk on social media. Sometimes I'll see this thread of like, why do we call it Broadway? Like, what's what's the word we should use to call it? You know, because you can't say performer because then there's directors, there's lighting designers. Like, like what do you call like the industry? Because Broadway's only here in New York. Like, do you just call it theater? Like, I just feel like artist is such a good word that kind of encompasses you know, everyone who works in it and like what we're actually doing, whether the show is Broadway or regional theater or wherever, it, it is art. So yeah. I like that word to, to uh, cover that. Um, so I first met you at Point Park University when you were a student. Um, you were already like way more mature than most people your age. So we'll talk about that too. But um, just give us a trajectory for people who aren't familiar with you from, you know, you were at Point Park and then, you know, what was that like 2015, 2016 when I met you? And here we are 2024, so like nine years later, and now you are, you know, playing lead roles on Broadway. So give us this trajectory. Uh, yeah, I, I met you uh, at Point Park University. I, I remember being like, oh, like somebody from New York, you know, and, and immediately wanted to pick your brain and just learn from you. And, you know, you were fresh from New York, which was nice. And um, yeah, so I, I studied at uh, Point Park, majored in musical theater, minor dance, uh, graduated a semester early, moved to New York and auditioned right away. Uh, January, I, I, I remember December before I graduated, like around Christmas with my family, cold calling. I had a sublet for January of New York, cold calling all the gyms nearby and just being like, please, I need a job. Ended up working at a gym uh, once I moved to the city and auditioned for everything I could. Uh, I was lucky I got my equity card before I moved to the city, which you actually helped me uh, decide on that. And from uh, Pittsburgh CLO, and then moved to the city. And so I was already in the database for Actors Equity and was able to kind of find my auditions from there. I would load up my week around my business, uh, my uh, gym schedule, because I just, it helps me with rejection. I overload myself with auditions because it makes it easy to forget the bad ones. Um, and yeah, and then I, I started working regionally once I moved to the city, uh, and then I had a itch to travel, and then I jumped on a cruise for nine months, saw the world, the entire world, started in Italy all the way up to New Zealand and then back. So I feel like I checked off a lot doing that and also got a taste of cruise life and saw if it was for me or not, realized it was not for me, and then uh, decided to go full force into work on land. And that took some adjusting because I, I knew I was all in and that required to go back into dance class, go back into acting, because then it was some time since I was in the grind of college. And, uh, and yeah, and then I, uh, I start, I booked a couple of nice regional gigs and then that led to uh, signature theaters, a chorus line, and then, uh, the pandemic happens and then, um, Coming out of the pandemic somewhat in summer 2021, I got a, a, an appointment for Chicago, which I had been in the mix once before, before and ended up making my Broadway debut with Chicago. And it's been wonderful, wonderful since, you know, Chicago has taught me a lot. And I think that being my first Broadway show and around so many people that are seasoned and have been in the business for a while has taught me so much. I feel like I've aged, uh, you know, from being there in the best way, uh, maturity wise. So, um, yeah, that's kind of my journey. And then uh, while, uh, performing in Chicago, I, uh, it's nice. I was able to do city center, uh, the life and a few, uh, independent movies and some workshops. And so that's also the nice thing about Chicago is that I've been able to incorporate some other things as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting you say about loading up a million auditions. So you forget about the bad ones. Um, Rochelle Rack was just the previous guest that we had on the show and she talks about, you know, going to the audition and she has her drop swing ball change as she always says, you know, it's like on, on to the next one and just kind of like leaving that in the past. And so, I think this is another good way to look at it. Like, oh, if I just have all these auditions, then I'm not dwelling on on the past ones. I'm, I'm just focusing on what the next one is. And so that's another good technique for people to to use. Um, you, you know, you always were very mature. Like I was very impressed with you from the beginning. Uh, 
and I don't know where that comes from. I mean, some of it might be from what we, we'll talk about here in this Broadway or in the Playbill article. Um, but I also know you were really involved with Broadway Dreams Foundation. So you were around a lot of people who had uh, seasoned professionals, as you said, about Chicago. And so it's interesting to hear you say that, you know, getting into Chicago, you, you got to learn from so many of them because I feel like you already were learning back in college from all these people and applying those uh, things. Uh, you were already out creating your own projects. I remember you were, um, I, I guess you probably knew Alex Newell from Broadway Dreams Foundation. And, and so then you were putting together the one night concert uh, that they were doing with a uh, Pittsburgh CLO. And then you asked me to come in and, and take a look at that and, and give you some advice because you were directing that and whatnot. And just, I think you're very good about uh, a creating the opportunities, B uh, using your network, like using, okay, I have this connection with Alex. Let's put this concert together. Uh, I have this connection to Jim. Let me bring him in. And like, you're very good at connecting. Even during the pandemic, I reached, I remember you reached out to me and said, Hey, I'd like to maybe do a reading of the show. Would you be interested in directing this? Um, even like when you were a student, you would come, the questions you would ask were very intelligent questions. And I never got the sense, uh, and this is important for people to understand, like I never got the sense from you that you were just networking, quote unquote, networking or trying to network. You legitimately wanted to know certain questions and you had very specific questions like like joining equity and, and these things you already brought up. You also, I feel like um, the the way that you would be excited about things that other people were working on um, it, it was like a genuine excitement. It wasn't, I guess what I'm trying to say is I feel like you, you naturally are someone who likes to be around people and connect people and, uh, create art with people and things like that. And that naturally builds a, a great network for you. And even before we started uh, recording this episode, we were just talking, uh, chatting, catching up. And, uh, we talked about how we were both lucky as soon as the pandemic was over, we both kind of went right back to work. And a lot of that came from our existing network. So, um, can you talk a little bit about that? Like, uh, a, like what your what your involvement was with Broadway Dreams Foundation, and then also how you see like networking and building relationships and stuff. Yeah, I um, it's interesting. So I think I had the kind of the perfect storm in high school. Of I had a teacher, his name was C.J. Mills, and he taught like our AV program at our high school, and I was in that. It was half AV program and then half power of thinking. He was really fascinated with the law of attraction, Dale Carnegie, um, and, and, and those, uh, empowerment books, empowering books. Uh, and so I really absorbed that and I had a really close connection with him. And so it was combination of, there was one thing that the biggest thing I took away from Dale Carnegie was surround yourself around people who are better than you, uh, and smarter than you and, and have the knowledge that you don't have. So I always. So at like 17, 16, I clocked that and knew that I wanted to do that for my life. And then also, you know, my parents got a pamphlet when I was 16 or 17, uh, for Broadway dreams foundation in the mail. And it was happening down at the Kimmel center. And it was really early in their, their life, uh, as a summer intensive. And, but that program kind of took me in and took me under their wing, uh, from the faculty to a nut Tanner, the owner and. And yeah, and, and so that kind of granted me the opportunity of people that recurred me in the business. And then also I was kind of taking in the things I was learning, my actual public house. Uh, and yeah, the, it's interesting when I talk to, you know, some universities and, and students and people that are just kind of getting into the business, um, I don't look at it as networking necessarily. I just look at it as human connection and, uh, and yes, yeah, some people may perceive it as you, like from afar, other people may perceive it as you wanting to get something from that person. But I genuinely think that not to take it to this place, but this is where my core is. Life is too short and that why not gain as much knowledge, be a student of life as opposed to student of business or student of, of your your nine to five job, which should be a student of life. And then that's what creates good art. And so I'm not looking for a job by connecting with you, but the, but the knowledge, let's say the knowledge that you gave me back at uh, Point Park, um, that gets passed down to somebody else that may be questioned. And so it's, it's, yeah, it's just an ongoing, um, 
capacity of energy. But yeah, uh, so that's kind of my idea of of what how I perceive networking, just genuine connections. Get to know somebody, get to know an artist, take them out to coffee, get to know where they came from, how they got to this point, um, and then something good will come of that. Whether it literally just be, oh, I need to do this, is because they learned from their mistakes that long time. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's something that I talk to people a lot about is if, like what you said about just getting to know them, uh, forming a real connection. A lot of times people think of networking as like, oh, what can this person do for me? And like, I want to take from them. And what I try to help people with is like, what, what is the reason why someone else would be interested in helping you? Mm -hmm. You know, like it's a, both people need to be benefiting from this relationship because it is a relationship. It's a friendship. It's a career relationship, whatever. Um, that, that you want to, you know, coin that term. Like that's really what it is. It's not a contact for business. It's a real life human being. It's a, it's a connection. And so, uh, you know, just using those two examples I, I mentioned earlier, like when you said, Hey, I'm working on this concert with Alex, can mm -hmm. you come look at this? Right. So it's not just like, Oh, tell me how to be a good director. It's like, okay, you're bringing something to the table for us to like talk about and work with and look at together. And uh, that's exciting. Okay. I'm going to get to go down, go to CLO, get to meet the artistic director there, be part of this rehearsal process with you. It's like, there's a benefit for me to spend my time doing that with you or, you know what I mean? So same thing with like, oh, do you want to direct this play during the pandemic? Well, great. If I'm not doing anything, yes, let's, let's talk about the potential of doing this together. Like there's things that would benefit both people. And those are, those are great ways to reach out to people and keep the connections going rather than Oh, can I just go get coffee and pick your brain? Because then it's like, then you're just using me to sit there and like be an encyclopedia for you versus like what, you know, we're, we're two human beings. Like, how are we going to connect? And that's something I, you know, you did very well in college was asking genuine questions about my life too. Not just, oh, how, do, how did you get to here? It was like, you know, who are you as a person? Where do you live? How long have you been in the city? Like just normal human being questions. And so it's a good lesson for people to, to learn. Yeah. And also, I want to go back to something you said, too, that you had a really good teacher saying that to you about surround yourself with the best people. Um, this is something Rochelle Rack and I actually just talked about last week as well. Um, and this is like funny, you two are back to back episodes. This wasn't planned, but a lot of similar themes here, which was especially in the younger generation. Um, and younger, I mean, by you, not not children, younger, younger for me <laughs> um, is that people are afraid to be around people that are better than them because it, mm -hmm. it it makes them feel insecure that they're not good enough or it's a threat to their talent or to their ego whereas in my generation and, and, and generations past that we were always told you stand next to the best person in class because you're going to get so much from that and i feel like that's why the there's like this disconnect in like the the quality of the work being done it's not so much an experience level that the people that are younger are inexperienced i just think they're not putting themselves around people who are really, you know, leaps and bounds ahead of them so they can absorb this. Because if you're going to the same dance classes, the same voice lessons, and you're not growing, or the people that you're surrounding with in your network are not really growing and doing bigger and bigger things all the time, or doing bigger things than you're doing, then you don't have anyone there as a role model. You don't have anyone to learn from. Um, and so I think like people mistake the the type of teachers that will like, you know, build you up with confidence, like, you know, cheer you on and do all that. They, they kind of mistake that as being like good teaching and like, yes, you want to have confidence. I'm not knocking that you, you definitely need your confidence, but you need more than just your confidence. And I think, like you said, you're in Chicago now with these seasoned professionals, you're going to get so much more information from those people than if you're sitting around with your friends and just like complaining about the business. You know what I mean? Yes. 100%. Yeah, I think getting out there uh, and, and yeah, just genuinely connecting with people. And it also just makes the art better too. Let's say you connect with somebody in the business, just a genuine connection, and then move on and you can draw from that conversation at some point or in your writing or, and, you know, kind of going back to what you were saying about reaching out to you during the pandemic. I'm a firm believer as an artist, the minute you start to become stagnant in your work, stop assessing and try to shake it up, try to shake it up, find something, do something, um, reach out to people that you are already connected with and have a genuine connection with and said, Hey, 
feel stuck right now. You don't have to say that it could be the subtext. Let's do something. And maybe they're at that same point. Maybe they're not. And the worst thing that people can say is no. So why not ask, right? It's like people are so uh, afraid of the no. Um, and I don't like that word either, but, but yeah, there, there, there will be a yes at some point, <laughs> you know, if you keep asking. Right. And just to finish the story too, like we never ended up working on that play together because we both ended up getting busy as things were starting to open back up, but it reconnected us. We got to have conversations. We got to catch up. It's again, keeping the people in your network alive and active and, you know, keeping those relationships going. and it makes an impression on the person of like, oh, this is someone who's like actually trying to make things happen and a go-getter. And so like, it, it's just shaping your reputation in a, in a way that makes people want to work with you and collaborate with you. So even if you get the no, like you just said, or even if the project never ends up happening, it's still worth the ask. And it's still mm -hmm. worth the conversations that we got to have during the pandemic and both commiserated about like how miserable it is right now. And like how we can't wait to get back and like, just have that genuine connection and reconnect with people. So I, I, I really, you know, I, I agree with you hundred percent and it's definitely always worth the ask. You're never going to know if you don't ask. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about this playable article because I mean, this is your story, so I'm gonna let you tell it, but I was really, really moved and touched by this. Um, I've, I've said sometimes on this show before that one of my missions as an artist is to bring communities together to make the world a better place to uh, make people think differently, inspire them. And usually we're talking about that in the context of the art we're making and the shows we're making. But something else I always say on the show a lot is that I feel like hum your, yourself as a human and as an artist, like those are so intertwined, it's really hard to like separate those two. And so using who you are as a human to also do that while integrating your art with that is also really amazing. And so this is what you basically did here. And I know you share the story, but I, I just think for people to, and I know you didn't do this to be inspirational or to, or to make these changes that, you know, you had no idea that like, oh, Jim's going to invite me on the podcast. If I, if I do these things like that, that wasn't the purpose of it. But by doing that, you never know how you're affecting someone else, not only just that individual, but then people knowing that story, how much it affects them. So, um, so I'd love you to share this story. Yeah. I, um, first off, I totally did the article to get onto this podcast. So, you know, <laughs> Okay, um, is that why you kept sending it to me every morning <laughs> and night and i was like okay fine um, no but that's a good good thing too like i saw the article and then i immediately sent it to you and said this is an amazing article i'm so impressed by you nothing to do i didn't even think about the podcast at the moment it was just like again genuine human reaction i was so moved and so proud of you that i just reached out to you and sent it so it's like exactly what we're talking about here yeah i um the the, the walton family they they had an article done on them in Montclair, New Jersey, and a couple of our actors over at Chicago live in Montclair, New Jersey, and Jen Dunn, Broadway legend, I, I love her. She's one of our Swedes. She texted me early one day and said, hey, I think you had this cancer when you were a boy. I'm not sure, but this family, this was in our newspaper today. And I read the article and I was, I was blown away, uh, in the article, you know, it talks about what Joey Walt is going through at this time. And it's the same cancer that I had. I had retinoblastoma. It's a cancer of the eye. Uh, I have unfortunately lost my left eye to cancer when I was a baby. And, uh, and yeah, so he's going through the same exact thing I went through, but not only that he's, he is going to the same exact hospital that I went to in Philadelphia, the same uh, doctor that's building his prosthetic, like just parallel story. Um, and in the article, it was talking about the J fund, which is uh, Tom Coughlin, the, he used to be a head coach of the New York giants, uh, created this foundation called the J fund to help families that were going through pediatric cancer and, and don't have the funds necessarily. Uh, they are paying for Mrs. Walton to not, she can't go to work right now. She has, she's a full caregiver. So they're paying for trips to the hospital and treatments and all of that, uh, really, really special. So I read the article and I was blown away, texted her. I was like, I need to get a, I, I want to get a hold of the family. I just want to talk to this mom. 
because in the article, she was talking about, you know, her insecurities about him living a normal life, that he will always be different. And what, what does this, what does his childhood ahead look like? All of these things. And I, so I reached out to Jen. I was like, I need to get a hold of this family. She connected me with the writer. The writer connected me with the family. And then I talked to the mom for like an hour or so. And she cried. I cried. And yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, she, yeah, she just kept asking questions like, is he, what, what does his childhood look like? Did you play sports? Did you, um, and you know, I answered those questions to the best of my ability. Um, but what she's going through, then I called my mom after that and I, we had the emotional response, um, just because it brought her back to where she was those years ago. Um, and yeah, so I, once I got off the phone with Mrs. Walton, then the J fund reached out and they were like, thank you so much for, you know, reaching out to her and talking to her. Uh, we think this is so special. Is it okay if we, oh, and I told her, I was like, I want to get you to Chicago to see the show. Um, you know, I'm on for Billy Flynn next week. And I think it would be really special to have you there. Um, and she was like, yeah, yeah. Let me connect you with the J fund, Mary at J fund. So then I talked to Jay Fun. I was like, if I have to pay for it out of pocket, I will. I want her to come and just see that what's what's a possibility for Joe. Um and and yeah, and then Jay Fun was like, we can pay for transportation, but not necessarily the actual ticket and stuff like that, because it is recreational. And then I reached out to Chicago. Chicago paid for the ticket, rolled out the red carpet, and uh and the Jay Fun before the Walton family came, said, we want to involve press. Are you comfortable with that? And I actually called my agent, um, Sean McKnight and explained to him that I had some reservations. I was a little nervous. You know, I, I didn't want this, believe it or not, I didn't want the business to look at me, um, as different. It's still kind of, it came down to that. Uh, and he was like, if you are comfortable with this, go for it. I think it's beautiful. I think it, if it's, uh, written the right way, um, it can be something very, very special, you know, just make sure that you read it before it goes to press. And yeah. And then I ended up moving forward with, uh, having, you know, Playbill come in and meeting the Walton family after I was home for Billy was what, uh, like I texted my friend Drew Nelson afterwards and other cast members came out after the show. And we took a bunch of pictures and we were a little teary eyed because, and I just kept looking at little Joey and being like, that was me. And he was just running around and he was the biggest ball of energy and joy. And, um, and seeing him, I still will never forget just seeing him run around the ambassador theater. Like everyone's emptied out. It's just me, the Walton family and some cast members. And it was, it was absolutely special, you know, and I also think it's just funny that his first Broadway show was Chicago. Was, I chose, it was like, I can't be Shrek. It couldn't be like, good Lord. Um, but, but yeah, it, it was, it was absolutely incredible. And now I have a connection with the Walton family, you know, she, uh, Mrs. Walton sent, sent me Christmas pictures and stuff like that. So, um. Yeah, I have a, a little buddy now uh, in my life, which is pretty cool. And, uh, and yeah, and then Joey Chambers uh, said she wanted to connect with me. She worked uh, as writer through Playbill.com and said she wanted to connect with me. And she wrote a beautiful piece that not only painted Joey not in a um, sympathetic light, but in a beautiful light. You know, it just shows that there are opportunities and, and even though he may feel different i do think that it can lead to something special yeah mm. yeah i'll link to the article on on this uh, page in the show notes because it i agree with you it's very well written um kudos to the writer for that what was your you said you had reservations about having the press come so what was the deciding factor like how did you eventually arrive at okay yes this is okay to have the press come be here yeah i i uh I'm interesting. Good question. 
I feel like I'm not afraid anymore. I think I'm, I, at this point now in my life, there was a time of shame, uh, always feeling apologetic when I tell artists that I'm working with or dance partners or in the audition room being like, oh, sorry, sorry, just constantly kind of like having my little bumps and stuff. I'm moving out of that phase and more of it, it is my power. It is my, my, what makes you different is what makes you special, you know? And I think that is universal. What difference is what, uh, what makes you different is what makes you special. Um, but for me, I think I'm finally finding that and wearing it as a badge of honor. And so I felt like whatever light it ends up painting, um, I'm ready for that side and that story of me no longer kind of hiding it because again, it's a prosthetic. So it's not, you know, if people think it might be a lazy eye. Some people are like, I had no, I had no idea. Um, it's interesting. I feel like some people, and this is just also the actor in me. Some people look at the eyes on somebody. Some people look at the lips. Some people look at the, you know, people have different focus points when they're talking to some. Um, and that kind of also comes out when I'm like, yeah, my eyes, I have no left vision whatsoever. I see over the bridge of my right side of my nose and that's it. Um, and you know, it's also interesting. It's just funny. The questions that come once I say, um, yeah, I lost my left eye to yeah and it's all it's it's kind of funny that we we whatever our insecurities are things that we're afraid of sharing with other people that it's like what are we actually afraid of i mean what's what is someone going to think by you saying okay i i lost my left eye it's a prosthetic like okay so what like i mean and i'm not i'm not belittling that i'm just saying that like we we all have these these fears. And I think people don't necessarily care as much as we think that they're going to care or that it's going to be a negative thing, but yet it's so terrifying to, to say some of these things that even with, you know, to relate it back to your career, which, you know, is not as important as your life what we're talking about, but even just like that microcosm of an example of like with branding and, and talking about how, what you said, like what is different about you, that is what is special. That is what draws people to you. And people shy away from that. And they try to be like everyone else and like make their website look like everyone else and make their photos look like everyone else. And it's like, no, like what is special and unique about you? And like, I think this Playbill article is amazing. Uh, and I think even if people do look at you differently, that's actually a good thing. Like it, it's going to give people like more appreciation for what you're, what you've experienced and more, um, just also like who you are as a person, like just to see like what you did for this family, you know, it, it extend so much goodwill and people wanting to work with you and be around you because of the type of person you are. So I love that you say that about what makes you different, makes you special. I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. It was, it was, it was very special. That's right. You, you actually in the article too, I don't, I don't remember if it was, you said this or, or the writer said this, but you, uh, it was talking about how, when you were growing up being a boy who danced, being someone who was mixed race, those were also things that made you feel like an outsider person. Uh, but you wore those like a badge of honor. So did you feel like there was a difference between those kinds of things and this, or, or did you have to go through the same process of, okay, this is what's making me special by having these differences? Um, yeah, I think at, at one point it felt overwhelming, uh, you know, mixed race, a boy that danced, uh, you know, memories from middle school through high school and, uh, and yeah, so at, at one point it did feel like I was kind of drowning with so many, how, how different I felt walking through, uh, through life. And this is very like, I keep it, we all keep our things deep down, but covered with a smile. Uh, but, but then I actually read a funny quote from Sammy Davis Jr. Uh, that stayed with me and it's kind of literally tracks with how I felt growing up. And, um, somebody asked him once, like, do you feel different? And he said, he was like, I'm a one-eyed black dancer. You tell me, you know, and it's like, yes, that's like, that is, yeah, I am different. Like, why the hell not like, so that, that quote kind of lips rent free in my head. Um, mm -hmm. that is. There's something cool. And also who's cooler than Sam? 
<laughs> but um, it, it is also interesting. I want to go back. Um, I remember when you said for some people, when they, when I tell them that they're like, yeah, okay. Um, one of the people that stick out to me uh, that I worked with, I'll never forget. Um, a former creative friend of mine told me just let the creatives know because it does sometimes lead to um, whether it's a traffic thing or especially in tech, like just let the stage manager know and your creatives know. And I walked up to uh, whom I absolutely love, Dennis Jones, for signatures of course line. I was like, hey, Dennis, and just so you know, you know, I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm blind in my left eye. I lost it to cancer. And he was like, great, thanks for letting me know. And I loved that. It was just so like, thank you. It, I didn't have to see a shift in his eyes. I didn't have to see empathy, sympathy, um, anything like that. And that, yeah, it goes, it goes a long way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, a lot of people will come up and tell me, you know, certain things that they can or cannot do because of certain limitations or, or things they're experiencing at the moment in their lives. And yeah, it's, it's never a big deal. I mean, it's so easy to work around all these things and, you know, like, I, I think for the person, it feels like a bigger deal than for what the other person is. And that's for us, you know, we always like, we're so concerned what everyone's going to think about what we're wearing. I mean, like everything we, we wonder about that and, and stress about that. And no one really cares. Yeah. Like we're, everyone's so worried about their own things that they're dealing with that they don't have time to deal with yours as well. You know what I mean? It's just like, it's, it's a good lesson. I mean, I remember, um, so I had a, a cancer that I had to have a surgery for, and I have this like long scar across my clavicle. And I remember when I first came home from the hospital, I, it, cause but they, when they did the biopsy, it was like, it was like a tiny little incision they had made. And so here I'm thinking that like, I'm going to have this like little scar when they actually do the surgery to take it out. And they realized like it had grown like through my whole chest. So they had to take the whole, it was like the size of my hand, like flat here, they'd take out. And so when I first like saw the stitches and saw that it was like hundreds of stitches along my, I just burst into tears because it was like so shocking and such like a, like not something I was expecting, but like my mind, and I was like so mad at myself for this, but like my mind just kept going to like, oh my gosh, my chest is never going to look the same and I'm going to have this scar forever. And like, what are people going to say? And what are people going to think? And I'm like, uh, first of all, I'm alive yeah. and I don't have to go through any chemotherapy and like the surgeon got everything out and that I'm not going to have any like long-term effects as I'm on a full range of motion again. Like, why aren't I celebrating my health and my my life and and said I was just so worried about like the optics of it, you know, oh, and it's it's like so. And I know like the first time, like every time I, I go swimming at a beach or a pool or something, like I feel like oh, what's that scar? Well, like, you know, it's like you have to tell the story again and again and again. Um, and but like you said, like you just start to get to a point where it's like okay, well, it is what it is. Yeah, like it doesn't matter. No one cares, and like you can move on with it. So, um, but but just to say, like I think everyone has things that they're dealing with. Um, and we don't always see these things. And, and so it's another good reason to just be nice to everyone. I was literally going to say, yeah, everyone's fighting a battle that you don't know. So just be kind. I think that goes a long way, especially too in our business. Um, yeah, that we can, it can be a little bit more kindness, I think at times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, if people want to donate to the J fund, is that something that people can do or how does that work? Yes, please do. We can, I, I can send you like media link or uh sure uh, yeah that yeah i'll put her i'll put that in the show notes uh as well um is there anything else about using art to make society better you want to talk about or anything of this any other ideas that this sparks because i i love this idea of really helping other people here yeah i think um yeah i think we get caught up that because theater is a business and that theater in new york generally is for profit um that we lose the idea that it is escapism and that people really do have their mundane days or issues throughout the day or lives that they're trying to escape and that we are creating art and um, that with that art, we, we help them escape. But then off the stage, they still see us as that entity and that what we do off stage does have an impact. And that's something that I am learning. Um, yeah. Yeah. One of my friends used to be a 
a bartender for Lion King. And he said, you know, these families, they save up money to come to New York. They've had this dream that they want to come to New York. They've spent all day walking around. They're probably exhausted. And he's like, and so every person that would come up to order a drink, he'd be like, how was your day? What did you do today? Like, just have a real conversation with them and make them feel like special and welcome because like, this is going to be an experience I remember forever. And so it's like, even if you are an usher or a bartender or uh, you work at the box office or, or whatever you do in the arts, like you don't know the impact you're having and kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier. It's just like being a nice person and just like kindness. It's, it's just really is going to ripple out and we, the world that we're living in now, I mean, we really, really, really need kindness because um, we're, we're just dividing ourselves up in all these different ways of like all the different ways that we are different, but yet we are all the same. Like we're all human beings. And if I always say like, you know, if aliens were coming to attack earth, like all the countries would band together and we'd all fight as one. Mm -hmm. And it's like, because we don't have like this common enemy, we end up making enemies of, of each other. And it's, it's so sad because we don't need to do that. We can celebrate each other and, and love each other. So, yeah. And I think uh, there was one thing that you said earlier that I do want to touch on, um, celebrating other people's success. I think as artists, we do struggle with that. Um, however, again, these are like these moments that I, I happen to me or I experience and I clock in the moment. We had a masterclass with Brian Cranston my senior year of college. And he said in the masterclass, he actually said two things that I think apply to what we've talked about. One, there is a genuine high that you get when let's say you are auditioning for the same thing with somebody and that person gets it and you are genuine, not the fake theater actor-y way of being excited for them, you are genuinely excited for them. There is a high that you will get from it because you know deep down in that, from that excitement that it's not for you. It wasn't intended for you. It was intended for that. So that was one thing that stays with me always. And then another in the audition room and in, uh, you know, theatrical processes that every single person in front of you wants to be somewhere else or wants to be at a different point in their career or do possibly doing something. Else. The casting director may want to be a director. The director may want to be uh, a producer. The choreographer wants to be the director, you know, and, and in that it, it frees up the pressure that you're like, oh, this person is that person and this person, you know, and you can just do your work. Everyone like in that moment, you want the job. You don't want to necessarily be auditioning. So it just frees up the pressure of that moment in time. Yes. I don't yeah, know. The Unnecessarily, but I was like, oh, that's a cool way of just freeing yourself up in the room um, of who's in front of you. Yeah. And just focusing on that everyone's there to do the same thing, which is get the show up, you know? Um, that's like when I've been in situations before, this, is, this isn't exactly what you're saying, but it's the same mentality of, you know, people that will like throw their resume around, like while you're in a show doing it together. And it's like, okay, well, we're all here now doing this show. So that's great. You did all those other things, but now we're here doing this. Yeah. And so like, let's just focus on this because people will throw it. You know, some people will really try to throw you with their, you know, their ego and like that you should be, you know, you know, bowing down at their feet and things like that. And it's like, okay, well, we're all here doing the same job. So like, let's, let's just put this together and let's be respectful of each other. And actually, I don't know if you have had a similar experience, but I've found that the people with the, the truly most in, impressive resumes don't throw it. A hundred percent. So it's like, okay. So that also frees me up when people do kind of get into that mode. I'm like, oh, nice. Very nice. That's incredible. You would show them kindness and just, yeah, just know that yeah. that's there. It's actually helpful advice too. Like when you are, uh, from a, someone who's on a creative team side, directing and choreographing, I feel like when I was younger, I would get insecure if I was working with someone who had a giant career or like won all these awards and like, okay, well, I'm supposed to be helping them with their performance. Like, but what I realized is like those people, especially if they're famous, they have so much pressure on them to do such a good job and they want to know, you know, they want the help, they want the feedback, they want that outside opinion and you know, I guess if they, if they audition for the show and then they get the show and they know your director, like they, they're still choosing to do it. If they had qualms about it, 
as you being the director or the choreographer, they would just back out and, and say no to the project. So it's the same kind of idea that even the people with the biggest resumes, like you don't need to be afraid of these people. <laughs> like they're, 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 they're there to do the work too. And so it's just, it's, it's really good advice all around. I, I love that you shared that. Thank you. Of course. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to put the Playable article down, and I will have the uh, the J Fund information on the show notes too. How should people connect with you if they have questions or want to, you know, meet you? Yeah, I, um, you can reach out on Instagram at Jeff Gordy, J E F F G O R T I, and uh, you know, generally I will respond and answer any questions that you have, whether that be with J Fund industry. Um, yeah, it, it New York can it, it it's very big. And you can feel, you know, whether it be lonely at times or lost at times, business, life. Um, but I'm very open that it's, no one should feel alone. So please reach out. Great. And I'll put that information in the your, uh, your Instagram handle in the show notes as well. Uh, thank you so very much. This was a great conversation. So inspiring. And I'm just, I'm really proud of you. I'm really happy for you. Uh, everything that's happened to you, you absolutely 100% deserve. Um, I'm a big fan of you. And so I'm just so excited to see how your career continues to unfold. Thanks, Jim. All right. Thanks for being here. Bye. Such a great conversation, right? I know you found Jeff and his story to be inspiring and also so empowering. I love what he said about what makes you different makes you special. That is so true in both our careers and in our lives. And it's such a beautiful way to end our last guest episode on this note. What makes you different? makes you special. So be unique, be yourself, go out there and celebrate yourself with the world. Now, I'll still be here with you one more week to wrap up the show for our season finale. However, if you have not yet downloaded your dream career blueprint, what are you waiting for? This gives you the unanimous advice from casting directors, producers, agents, directors, choreographers on what you need to do to book your dream jobs. And I'm giving you a free copy of it. So there's no reason not to download it. So you can click the link in the show notes to grab your free copy. Also, if you have any questions on this episode, you can drop those into the comments below this video. I personally respond to each one, or you can send me a DM over on Instagram. I'm at Jim Cooney NYC. And if you like this episode, hit the like button to help more people find out about it. And also be sure to subscribe and get notified so you don't miss any episodes. And finally, if you love this show and you want to help support it, leaving a small tip is greatly appreciated. It helps me cover the production costs. And there's a link in the show notes for you to be able to do that. Remember, there is no one on the planet who is just like you. Stay true to the gifts you have and who you are. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Now, here's a little preview of next week's episode. I will see you then. Let's talk about building wealth. And what do I mean by that? I mean, no longer living paycheck to paycheck. I mean choosing where you want to live and who you want to live with, if anyone at all. It means freedom to turn down the jobs that don't interest you. It means a freedom from even submitting for those kinds of jobs. It means building your dream lifestyle, where you eat, how you dress, where you go on vacation. All of these things are under the building your wealth umbrella. And if you're sitting there thinking like, oh yeah, right, not in the theater industry, Well, think again, because what I'm going to show you today works regardless of what industry you're in and regardless of how much money you make or don't make, because I'm going to show you three strategies that don't rely on your income at all or making any more income. 